Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kristen Walters, and I am a partner and the food and beverage practice leader at Mazars in the U.S. Thank you for joining us today for today's webinar, The Future of Food, Innovation as a Way Forward. Innovation has always been a necessary way for food and beverage companies to stay relevant and achieve sustainable growth and profitability, but this has become especially true when reflecting on the last two years. We are excited to have today's panel of speakers here to discuss how being innovative through new product development, diversi diversifying distribution channels and marketing, and the utilization of new technologies has been critical to their business's success. At Mazars, we keep a pulse on industry trends and innovations. We recently published our 2022 Food and Beverage Industry Outlook, which is based on a survey of industry leaders and decision makers that span the food and beverage supply chain. This year's report found continued shifts towards health and wellness, increased investment in supply chain improvement, and introducing new products to the marketplace. To download the full report, you can click the link in the chat. I also wanna take a moment to share that our New Jersey Food and Beverage Forum will be taking place on May 11th at the Maplewood Country Club. It will be an evening of networking and food and beverage with food and beverage industry leaders and a fireside chat with Brian Choi of the Food Institute and Andy and Tom Gellert from Gellert Global Group. We are so excited to be returning to our in-person format and hope to see you there. Finally, I'd like to thank our event sponsors for both the upcoming forum and today's webinar, J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, Silver Grove Advisors, Greenbaum Rose Smith and Davis, Hub International, and ADP. Again, thank you for attending today's session and I'll pass it over to our moderator, Christopher Doring, Senior Reporting at Food Dive to introduce our panel and get started. Kristen, thank you very much. Uh, panelists, I appreciate you taking time to, to join us. Uh, before we dive into questions, uh, Lou, Michelle, and Frank, if you could just take a quick moment to uh, introduce yourselves and uh, tell us more about uh, what you do. I'll start. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, th thank you, Mazars, for having us on this panel today. My name is Lou Cooperhouse. I'm a CEO and co-founder of a company called Blue Nalo. We're based in San Diego, California, and our company uh, is, is really developing global leadership in a category of manufacturing seafood directly from fish shells. So it's not wild, it's not farmed, it's a new way, it's cell cultured, and uh, excited to be on this panel today. Thanks. Hi, Hi everybody. Um, Kristen, thank you so much for having us today. My name is Michelle Reddick. I am the founder and CEO of the Better and Delicious Food Company, known on shelf as the Bad Food Company. Um, we manufacture better for you cookies, granola, and we are just launching our uh, refined sugar-free chocolate chips into the market and looking forward to today's panel. Hi, everybody. My name is Frank Rapaki. I'm the director of Front of Funnel Innovation and Sensory Design uh, at the Campbell Soup Company. Uh, specifically, I'm focusing on the snack side, uh, brands like Goldfish, Milano Cookies, um, and our salty portfolio of Kettle Brand potato chips, for example. Um, you know, a lot of uh, what I do, my teams are responsible for helping drive new product innovation uh, within the snacking space. I'm just really excited to be here today. Thank you, everyone. Um, with further ado, let's, uh, you know, let's dive into questions. Uh, with innovation, our, our topic today, where do you all see innovation in the food space? And where, where is it the most prevalent and ultimately uh, you know, the longest lasting? Where, where do you see this ultimately going? Frank or uh, Frank, would you like to start? Sure, no problem. Um, I mean, I think you know, as, as we said before, innovation is sort of the lifeblood of food companies. Uh, for brands and products to be, um, you know, to be relevant to consumers and really to be able to continue to delight um, and, and really engage with consumers, um, you know, and it, it's really just critical that you, you have new, new opportunities to engage with these consumers and they can sort of vet these product, uh, products that you put forward. So, um, in my mind, you know, food innovation has got to continue across the board. 
Um, and I think it's definitely, you know, if you think about the trends that are in this space, I think you think things like regenerative agriculture, you see trends in terms of plant-based um, and, and really just an elevation of the overall food experience. And just, you know, I think it's a really exciting time to be in food, uh, given all of these trends and opportunities that, you know, consumers are ultimately clamoring for. Are there some examples, Frank, that you can you can point to at Campbell Soup that you've done that that you see, you know, being a normal course of business for the for the company that say five or ten years ago may have been an afterthought? Sure, I think that you know as you know you try and you know one example I think is you know within snacking, um, you know we have a, a a really nice portfolio of brands that really help. Uh, folks indulge when they want to, but also we have some better for you options as well. Um, but, you know, for instance, I, I look at Goldfish as one of our flagship brands where um, we've tried to deliver bigger and bolder flavors through limited time offerings like Frank's Red Hot and, uh, you know, our recently launched Jalapeno Popper Goldfish. I think we have some Old Bay uh, is on deck. So really, you know, sort of co-branded joint partnerships to deliver, um, you know, a broader reach of flavor experiences and really shifting a brand from something that for a long time was a mom and kid opportunity to now an all family opportunity. So that's just one example of something that was, I think maybe 10 years ago, um, you know, it wouldn't have looked to expand in that way. Lou or Michelle? Um, sure, I, I'm just gonna say that, um, I completely agree with everything Frank said in terms of what he's seeing and how it's evolving. But as a as an entrepreneur of a smaller business, I also think there's a lot of exciting innovation coming from smaller food businesses in the past few years, uh, in addition to some of the larger companies. Um, and I, I think it's also the larger food companies, in addition to consumers, are actually noticing some of these new um, new food trends and the new innovation that's coming. And I, I'd love to see the fact that the market is open to innovation from uh, smaller, newer um, food entrepreneurs. Uh, I think the access to joining the business has become easier in the last five years because the market is very receptive to that. And I think it's brought a lot of really great new ideas into the market. Yeah. Just to, just to add on, Chris, um, to everything that was said thus far is, you know, innovation, you know, my, my career has uh, been several decades now in food innovation. And one thing that's never changed for me is innovation never stops. You know, so I think the, I think as Frank said it too, the challenge, of, frankly, it's a challenge of the food industry is uh, consumers, uh, you know, are constantly seeking something new, you know, and, and that's really unique to the food sector, you know, so I think, you know, the, the days of, of, uh, of of more stable products that are that are there for perpetuity is you know is continually shor shorter lived and I think consumers are always looking for new flavors new ideas you know and what I what I personally found is is consumers are just reading labels in a very different way they're they're all about reading ingredient statements or looking for products that have uh, as we all know cleaner labels uh, ingredients they can recognize but they're also uh, looking to learn more about the company that's manufacturing. It's no longer a food that's just a product that we consume in your belly. It's really an experience. So food has become very social, very experiential, um, very much communicating your values. And, and that's why we're seeing a lot more activity in, in all sorts of ways uh, from foods that communicate sustainability benefits um, or supporting the planet in, in various different ways. So it really is a uh, continual evolution of the food sector, um, you know, really driven by innovation that again, never stops. I'd like to kind of just tie in points uh, that you all, all have made. Uh, you know, it wasn't all that long ago, I, you know, I guess that innovation obviously was happening, but, but it seemed to be a bit more, not as quick, not as rapid, maybe a bit more static, if you will. Why is innovation now happening so much faster? Is it, you know, to some of the points you made that consumers, you know, want new flavors and products? Is it because of you know startups like Michelle's that that are you know innovating and getting you know cash that kind of ultimately gets them to to product or to market faster. Is it social media that's playing a role? What ultimately is is you know causing innovation to to happen at such a rapid pace? 
I'm just going to answer from where I sit. I do think um, what you just said um, in that list, social media, as a smaller business entrepreneur, I hear directly from customers. Um, I'm able to listen to them, respond to them, react to them in a way that maybe takes a bigger company a bit longer. But I do think overall, it is um, that access directly to the consumer that maybe didn't exist previously that is helping companies hear what's working, what's not working, what they like, what they're looking for. They are very clear when they reach out to you to let you know what they do like and also what they don't like. And um, I think it, it minimizes the amount of time that used to be required to create a product, test a product, get feedback on a product. Now your feedback is, is real, you know, um, almost instantaneous. I can send samples to a customer or anybody who reaches out to me on social media and get feedback, you know, in under a week. So I think that has a lot to do with connecting you directly to the end use consumer and, and knowing uh, what they're thinking of your product. Yeah, just just add to that too. I you know, I think that what um, you know, what, what's really what's really changed a lot that Michelle kind of brought up is is social media, but also distribution channels. You know, in in in, in decades ago, retail was a dominant place where people got their products, and it was a bit more of a real estate situation. You know, with products that were there on a continual basis. You know, now we're seeing food service obviously uh, taking on even new forms post COVID. Uh, you know, knock wood, it is in fact post COVID, but um, that, you know, that there's now there's new ghost kitchens, new ways of getting products to your delivered to your house and social media is clearly a dominant force here. I've seen lots of instances where people line up around the block uh, for a brand new product. You know, you know, Frank mentioned LTOs, you know, product that might be available at a certain time. You know, the, the amount of instantaneous, uh, you know, feedback is really, you know, totally, totally all about the food sector. Um, people just get so excited by food. Again, it's, it's become an experience and, uh, and, and social media really plays to that, that, you know, that and Instagram in particular really play to that opportunity. Well, and I think, you know, one of the things that Lou, just to build on your and Michelle's points is that, you know, the, at least coming from a big corporation, you know, smaller companies are pushing the, the bigger companies to be more thoughtful and, and to work faster. You know, the trends and the consumer tastes are evolving there. You know, like you said, people are more engaged in what they're eating. They want to know more. They want to be more engaged. The barriers to entry, if you have a good idea and you want to, you know, get out there and put something on shelf and get that feedback, you know, it, it's not impossible to be able to, to drive things from an idea to a shelf um, in, a, in a relatively short period of time. So I think it's creating a great competitive environment where, um, both startups, established corporations, retailers, consumers, ultimately, um, can really, you know, create an ecosystem where we're pushing to get better ideas, better food experiences, look for just better, healthier, more indulgent, um, you know, more indulgent products that, you know, really just drive that better eating experience. And food is just so critical to how we live as humans. It's, it's, it's a great thing to see. And I, I just want to add quickly, I'm sorry, but to what you just said, like food defines us as humans. I think, you know, it used to be you would see commercials or ads with the family around the table eating or, you know, putting ketchup on a, a burger or something. But I do feel like right now with social media and um, all of the trends, food somewhat defines who you are, you know, or, or who you are is defined by the food that you're eating and consuming. And so I think that's actually making a difference in how brands are now trying to connect. It's no longer just offering something, but we want to be a part of who you are. Frank, I'd be curious to get your, your thoughts on, you know, a lot has been made about how, you know, large CPGs are ultimately learning from the work that's being done at, at some of these smaller, smaller startups and smaller companies like what Michelle is doing. I, I'd be curious, you know, how do you go about you know, is it just monitoring the market? Are you, are, you, are you looking over, you know, some of these startups to kind of see what work they're doing? How are, how are you 
are you getting inspiration from some of these young companies and, and how are you going about getting that inspiration? No, absolutely. I mean, look, the Campbell's organization is a 150 year old organization that, you know, is built around canned soup, uh, which is a phenomenal thing. I mean, the Campbell's brand has a, a place, I think, in, in everyone's uh, kitchen pantry. Um, but ultimately, as we've grown into more of a balanced company with an enormous snacks portfolio, it's, it's a different occasion. It's a, it's a little bit of a different look at the consumer and their engagement. So it's critical for us to be monitoring consumer trends, what's going on in the market, how competitors and startups are, are interacting. We've developed a, a tool that we use within our organization called the Insights Engine which helps us monitor events, trends, new launches, new products, new, um, uh, new competitors and small startups in the marketplace. Um, and we've also taken our turn with trying to learn from startups where we've had um, incubator activities. We've tried to you know, connect with smaller startups and tried to find ways to, to learn and grow and, to, and take sort of a more of a growth mindset into our innovation approach. One thing that's that's really emerged so far is you know just the speed of how things are happening, and I'd be curious to see your thoughts on this. All three of you, you know, innovation is happening much faster than ever before. Um, you know, products that used to take, you know, several years to launch are being done in a matter of weeks or months. Um, on the surface, that would appear to be a good thing. I'd be curious to get your thoughts on the on the pace of innovation there. You know, is, is the the speed good, and ultimately, how does that impact? you know, your businesses, you know, and the various sizes and, and positions that you're coming to the industry from. I'm just going to jump in and say for me, the speed of the innovation is a, a double-edged sword um, as a smaller brand and, and as the recipe creator uh, and original founder, I love to be innovating and changing, but also, there's a lot, you know, for me as a small company that goes along with that, changing my packaging, you know, um, just making any any change that I make to my product, you know, has to reflect all the way through to the distributors and then the, the retailers who put it on shelf in terms of any changes that I make. And all of that um, is time consuming and costly. So... Um, there's, there's a definite great side to being able to innovate quickly and change quickly, but there's also for me as a smaller brand, as, as a, uh, a newer brand, it's, it's also harder in some respects to be able to respond to those changes, um, in a cost-effective way. I can, I can add to that too, just in, in my world of, uh, doing something that's very innovative for sure, but also not particularly speedy. Um, but I, when I started Blue Nalu, I actually had the same conversation to myself about the speed of innovation. And candidly, I was very familiar and, and actively in working actively in the plant-based foods category. And I saw that as very rapidly changing, that I saw the birth of that with Apostle and Beyond and other products in the space, but also saw that there wasn't much competitive insulation, that you know, large companies where I've worked at could easily do that in a different way. So, so that level of innovation and, and the simplicity of the ingredients that would follow was something I projected in phase two, phase three, phase four. So cell culture seafood, a business I started, was one that has quite a bit of competitive insulation because it's never been done before. There's a considerable amount of IP there, but IP is not very normal in the food sector. But these are some of the challenges that we all face is just... Uh, the speed of innovation, you know, can spiral into uh, products, uh, and we're seeing that even on the plant-based category. Companies that had a had a big boom, and now we're seeing a bit of quite a bit of competition, and even going private label. So, 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 you know, these are all the threats if you have for a very successful product in the first couple of years that could be displaced pretty rapidly by those with a lot of muscle in the years uh, that follow. So, so really being very thoughtful about the products that we that we select and the technologies and potential for 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 IP are all things to be to be considered. Yeah, and I think you know within within our organization, I think the the ability to move faster on innovation is critical. Um, you know, you don't want to be viewed, you don't want your brands to be viewed as stagnant. You want to be out there competing for that share of the consumer's mind and the share of the stomach. So for us to move fast is critical. I think we do that 
and you know within large organizations you know i think it's important that you know nothing is done alone everything is done um in a sense of radical collaboration it's not um everything is always created internally we collaborate with our suppliers with our vendors our packaging um, vendors we work with a variety of different outside agencies to help speed up um, the ideas that we come up with the prototypes that we come up with uh, the processes that we use to get there and make decisions and then ultimately it really comes down to for us you know you, you know michelle speaks of the double-edged sword of innovation yes for us, we can we can have lots of ideas, um, but ultimately the prioritization has to get to a point where you focus and want to get things out quickly. So I know, you know, in the example, some of the you know chunky soup uh, coming out with a spicy version, you know, was done very quickly. Some of our LTOs are done very quickly within you know weeks versus what might have taken six months to a year in, in previous times. So those, you know, those are ways where we take things down a path and just ultimately the businesses have to help us prioritize um, so we can drive that innovation into the market. Frank, given that speed, are there any risks of, of you know, getting products out that quickly that you, you need to, to monitor to make sure maybe that you know, it's still true to the brand or, or that there isn't some potential you know, impact you could have by being too quick? So, I mean, there's, there's always a risk um, in launching any new innovation. Nothing, nothing is risk-free, but, you know, as they say, no risk, no reward. Um, I think that the benefit of being a large corporation and having a portfolio of brands allows us to help prioritize, okay, what brands do you want to take risks on and what brands do you want to be more careful on and, and be more thoughtful about it? Regardless, all innovation gets tracked and everything gets looked at very, you know, very closely. Um, and we learn from that. I think that feedback loop is important because ultimately um, getting feedback from consumers, that, that initial test market, that first um, you know, three to six months is just so critical to ultimately, you, know, you want long-term success. You want people to constantly buy them. You want trial, but you want people to come back and, and repeat on those products. So um, there's always risk, um, but hopefully we can continue to learn and grow iteratively. I'd also be curious, Frank, to, to, if you could touch on a little bit, you know, this question, you know, how has the pandemic altered how you go about innovating? And then I'll, I'll open up to Michelle and Lou. But, you know, I read one story where you, you all are depending on like your factory workers um, and, and using like, you know, FaceTime and that kind of thing to depend on them to, you know, make sure because they're the experts in a lot of these products, like they, they know how it looks, how it tastes and how it should, should come out. I want to see if you could touch on that. And then, uh, Michelle, if you, you can chime in from your business's perspective. Yeah, I mean, for us, the, the pandemic definitely changed the way that we had to innovate, the way we went about driving our innovation portfolios. Um, obviously, collecting ideas from our, our folks that are in our plants has been very valuable, and they've helped us generate some really great product ideas that have helped fill our innovation pipeline. But also, they've helped us solve um, you know, some, some challenges that have come up with, within the pandemic. Um, and, and that has helped us, um, you know, like I said, sort of help us achieve our goals uh, as the year, you know, the two years of the pandemic have kind of gone on. Um, but I will say it's, it's something very different when you're working with teams of people cross-functionally in a single location to everybody being remote and maybe one person developing products in the lab shipping products out to people, doing virtual tastings, getting feedback, um, you know, trying to trying to make decisions on product in a very um, distributed format. I mean, all of that is, you know, how we survive the pandemic, but there are behaviors that we want to keep, um, you know, some of that, some of that broader thinking of, you know, where ideas come from, how we source those ideas. We want to keep that as we, as we move forward, uh, hopefully coming out of the pandemic. Michelle? Yeah, um, I mean, I that rings so true to me, uh, Frank. I, I'm going to start out and say that first and foremost, um, my innovation team would be my children, who are my most severe critics. And uh, being that they were home through the pandemic, I definitely got a lot of real-time feedback. But beyond that, um, you know, like Frank just said, being home during COVID, it was hard to work collaboratively when you're innovating and, and get feedback 
Um, so there was definitely a lot of back and forth working on a product, sending it out to a group of people, whether it's the as the same team that you're working with on each product or finding different teams of people to work on on different products and then getting their feedback. Um, you know, I also think for me personally, um, having been a, a chef first, um, I always relied on not just what somebody told me, but watching them when they ate something, their, their facial expression when they see it, um, their body language when they eat it. And not having that is difficult for me when I'm innovating because I actually do take so much more from what's not said than what is said. Um, but I just had to learn. I had to rely on what people were telling me um, and, and go from there. So it was a shift from how I normally would have been creative um, and my process in the kitchen or, you know, a, an R&D situation. But I just had to, to adapt to that. How, how Michelle, has, has the pandemic kind of just influenced, say, that maybe the pace of product rollouts that, that you were going to do? Have you had to slow it down? Um, and ultimately, what does that mean for your, for your business going forward? Yeah, thanks. That's actually a really great question. Um, you definitely slowed me down. And, you know, I, I'm laughing because, of course, when I launched, which was March of 2020, um, I really had... Um, a two year plan of, you know, not only my initial offerings, but a rollout of, you know, future product and all of these things that were on deck for me. And definitely all of that slowed down for so many reasons. Um, a lot of, you know, even the, the factory, the co-packer that I work with and the R&D team throughout COVID, losing staff, um, people leaving their jobs because they had kids at home. I mean, in that regard, everything slowed down and uh, not just affected me, but I know everybody else that they were working with, but for sure it affected me. I just didn't have the accessibility um, to do the work and uh, the work that we were doing was definitely slowed down. But even on the flip side, not so much the R&D people that I'm working with, but just the actual business itself, um, it was harder to get on shelf during COVID, uh, which of course slowed everything down because you don't want to start launching new product when you're still trying to get out, you know, your first um, group of products that you had planned as your initial launch. And also, you know, the truth is um, throughout COVID, even when you, as a, as a new brand, I was very excited when I got on shelf at a retailer, but there have been no demos, no sampling. Um, so even getting customers to try your product and getting that foothold and, and being established has taken much longer and been much slower than I think it would have been had I been able to be in stores or had a team doing demos and sampling. So I really had to slow down the innovation that I was working on because I needed to secure my initial offering on the shelf and, and in retailers. And also, you know, like I said, people are just now starting to, uh, or, or the co-packer that I'm working with is just now starting to have more staff on a regular basis than I think they had over the past two years. Has, has it has it maybe forced you to, not to say you wouldn't have done this otherwise, but maybe be more focused, take more care, um, you know, in these products that you're rolling out and being more, more sure, as sure as you can be before the rollout? 100%. Um, but absolutely what you just said i i would say 100% is true but i i will say it also helped me refocus on what i thought my next set of products should be based on the feedback and what happened with my first launch i had more time to um get feedback think through uh, what was taking place with the business in the, in the preliminary launch, which actually did change um, some of what I was thinking. For example, I had new products that I was expecting to come out with by the end of year two. And instead, I actually am more focused now on new sizing 
of the products that I already have out that are doing well. So, so offering the same product, but maybe in a different way to a different consumer, as opposed to coming out with completely different flavors or products. So it definitely had me refocus based on what I was learning early on and what I think the needs are gonna be now coming out of COVID. Um, so for me, it was a definite, um, I definitely changed what I thought my innovation and my product launch going forward was going to be. Frank, I'd like to, to bring it to you. And then Lou, if you want to chime in afterward, you know, obviously Campbell's Soup has, has you know, a sizable budget and staffed. Um, but I'd be curious, you know, when it comes to innovation from a big business's perspective, you know, have, have the last few years, you know, changed how you go about doing it as far as even though you have these resources, are you more focused and, and more resourceful? And if you could give some yeah. examples. Yeah. Sure. I mean, for us, I think, you know, I, yes, we have resources, you know, we are a big organization, we definitely have resources, but like anything else, I think it's important that we are, um, you know, we have to have focus, you know, we need, we need to think about the return on investment that we have that we put in. Um, you know, you start with a lot of ideas, and hopefully you progress a lot of ideas down to a few and, and you, you know, you sort of you start to evaluate which things you want to move forward. Um, ultimately, you know, we've, we've done, a, I think, a, an admirable job through the pandemic as we've progressed things on, on trying to focus on, you know, where we can make an impact for our business and, and for our consumers. And I think, um, you know, we've done it in a couple of areas that are, are, tr are trending and things that we've done that are, um, you know, that, that I, that I look back on things that we've done during the pandemic. So for instance, you know, you think about trends in um, sustainability and some of the some of the goals we have as an organization um, and getting, you know, to uh, our goldfish uh, and, and cookie packaging uh, to be recyclable, which before it wasn't. So that like that was a that was an innovation that took uh, took place on our packaging side that I thought was great, um, you know, being able to get some of our new flavor LTOs out the door in under, you know, 10 weeks. Uh, being able to do that development, make those changes, being able to get feedback, make adjustments with vendors um, and drive products out in the market very quickly. Um, and all in an environment where, you know, you think about what's happened with labor during the pandemic. Um, we've had challenges with staffing in our plants, similar to like Michelle had mentioned, um, you know, uh, trying able, you know, trying to get that plant time to be able to run those trials so that you can know when you you're ready to launch that you're able to build inventory and 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 hit your acv targets and get product out there on the market for consumers to enjoy um just so critical for us to do that and especially in COVID, that's that's something that you know as things have lifted we've gotten better at you know we're getting back to full staffing and we're able to move a lot faster but you know just being able to to get into the plant, run those trials, do things quicker. And just by the time we get there, we have to be focused for that launch. Lou, anything anything from your perspective? I just want to add, Chris, um, it, we're, we've, we've been on the uh, receiving end, if you will, of another way in which innovation is happening. So we're actually have uh, nine, literally nine different strategic partners. So companies, you know, of the of the size, if you will, of a Campbell. So in Asia, we're working with Mitsubishi, Sumitomo, Thai Union, Plomo uh, in a in a food and life. Uh, it's a thousand unit sushi restaurant chain in, in Europe, Nomad Foods, and Utreco in the U.S. Rich Products in Griffith. So we're actually working with all these organizations. Some are investors, some are more collaborators, but they're formal agreements where we're actually working together. So sometimes innovation happens, uh, you know, through through these kind of relationships. So strategic partnerships of one form or the other are, are a way in which large companies, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, Michelle mentioned as well, the small companies, uh, you know, like Bunalu and, and, and Michelle's as well, you know, we're, we're all doing things that are kind of very much, you know, out of the norm perhaps, or, or somehow differently or really identifying niche opportunities or sometimes very large opportunities. Um, and large companies uh, really want to be you know, at the table, you know, and, you know, if, you know, under the right kind of situation, circumstances, you know, all, all companies can can really benefit. And there's great synergy there. Um, so again, I think we'll see more large company, small company 
collaborations going forward. You know, sometimes that's through these acceleration or food incubation models that exist that large companies are increasingly doing as well. They're even helping to fund startups that can be part of their, their uh, network. So uh, I think we're seeing new models for how innovation can come to be going yeah, forward. Lou I, Lou, I think you make up, a, you, know, you bring up a good point and, and Frank and Michelle, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on this. You know, you know the, the fact that it, it seemed like product development for a long time was very siloed. And now you have, you know, companies partnering with each other, you, brand licensing is, is accelerating and companies, you know, you know, Frank, you mentioned, you know, Frank's Red Hot is, is one example of that. I, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on, on you know, expounding on what, what Lou said in terms of, you know, working with other companies and, and you know, finding inspiration and, and insight into product development from what other companies, um, you know, outside your walls have done. Yeah, I definitely think that it's a case where, you know, people are open to the conversations and, and trying to see what we can make happen. You know, you think about, you know, the number of big corporations that have startup incubators where they're looking to fund and, and invest in startups. I know, uh, you know, for example, you know, Mondelez has got Snack Futures and, and they have a, they have a bunch of things that they're investing in. So. You think about how those have progressed over the last, say, 10 years and how they look at that to help drive innovation, um, you know, whether it's, you know, working with McCormick on Frank's Red Hot, whether it's even, you know, people that will connect others, uh, you know, to really help drive some innovation. So on, you know, our, you know, our, our cookies business, you know, trying to, you know, trying to develop our, you um, you know, our farmhouse uh, cookies brand, which is a thin and crispy cookie and trying to trying to drive growth in that business and how we, you know, how we think about um, expanding that portfolio. We find a variety of people willing to jump in and help and give us ideas on how to push these things forward. So for me, I think it's the openness to, you know, possibilities now in the conversations versus maybe, you know, not too long ago, maybe people were a little standoffish and worried about protecting what was being done internally. Um, I, I'd, I'd be interested to just to hear, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of trends out there that we, we've touched on just a few, you know, whether it's sustainability, whether it's snacking, whether it's plant-based, whether it's, you know, supply chain, uh, you know, regenerative agriculture, the list goes on and on and on. Um, you know, how do, how do you all go about, you know, honing in on innovation and, and really avoiding the pitfalls that could potentially come from trying to be all things to all people? Because there's so many things you could be doing when it comes to, to product development. For me, yeah. for me, it's um, it's. I get so many emails asking me, you know, if I'm plant based or vegan, and uh, you know, I have to, I do, I have to respond and say to people, as much as we would like to be everything for everybody, we just aren't. And instead of me chasing after what they're asking for. I'm still so new that I really have to stay within what I defined my company to be. And that's my lane right now. And I just cannot respond to everybody who asks me to be something different. Um, and it's hard because you do want to appeal to all of these different people. And when you have a customer who reaches out, um, you do want to be able to answer them and say, yes, I can, you know, definitely do for you what you want. But you know, as a company, um, and and for me, as I'm setting my mission and defining what I'm about, I I really have to drown out some of the noise that I get from what's happening around me and stay in my lane and find my place. And I, I believe there's place for everybody. So sorry, but but I have to find my my place and I have to stick to it for a while. Frank. I mean, for, for us, and I would agree with Michelle, the, the take that I would give from, from sort of the Campbell's perspective is, is that we have a lot of brands. We have a lot of legacy brands. We have some newer, uh, we have some newer brands that all resonate with the consumer um, in, in a particular way and mean something to the consumer. We invest in speaking to the consumers, and whether it's through traditional advertising, whether it's through social media, those brands have guardrails, they have values, they stand for something. So I think it's important that as we look at our innovation and what we're trying to innovate on, we have to stay true to those brand guardrails. Now, guardrails can shift 
how we think about the our consumers and how they have also, for instance, how we've shifted from sort of a mom and kid positioning on uh, on goldfish to more of an all family positioning. Um, you know, to me, that's an example of how the brand guardrail changed, but that is not something that's undertaken lightly. And that's something that requires a lot of attention where there are other, you know, other guardrails where you look at our, our late July tortilla chip business, which is uh, organic and, and really has a lot of uh, badge value in the, in the natural channel where we try and, you know, deliver against those. We have to make sure that our innovations live into those brand guardrails and we have to be very thoughtful about what we do so it's great to always start with blue sky but ultimately as we start to filter ideas we really have to filter them through the consumer and how they view our brands lou from from your company's perspective i i you know how do you how do you go about you know innovating and communicating with the public when you know, cellular agriculture or aquaculture is something that may be a little bit foreign and, 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 and a mystery to some people. How do you go about communicating with people, you know, particularly as you, you know, ultimately await, you know, FDA approval and, and getting your product to market? Yeah, yeah, um, great question. And, and if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just pick up on the last comment too, is uh, um, from Frank and Michelle that, you know, I think if you look at our consumers, our consumers aren't always so pure either. So they may want this uh, this product that you know, that solves every problem, but you know they may also have uh, the delicious uh, hot fudge ice cream sundae and then have a salad you know to follow you know six hours later, so, so you know because they you know because people at different times of day are different people, so so our consumers themselves aren't so aren't so pure all the time. Some are, but a great majority of us are not. So so that being said, I think what really drives is is taste. So, so back to your question, Chris, you know, what Blunala is all about is delivering a product that does not compromise on taste, texture, mouthfeel, you know, really delivering to the consumer the same product as conventional seafood made in a new way. So we've actually were a bit of a pioneer in even the whole nomenclature work, which you may be familiar with, what to call this product. So I actually wrote an article medium, you know, it, you know it's not wild, it's not farm, but what do you call seafood made directly from fish cells? So, so we actually sponsored some research uh, that really identify what the appropriate nomenclature was. We want consumers to know that it's not wild or farm, that it's something different, and we want them to select it because of that. Um, why? You know, so in our world of benefits, we're actually able to make what's today a bit of an oxymoron, you know, mercury-free, microplastic-free, uh, still delicious, same nutritional content, same great omegas, um, but all, you know, all the things you love about seafood but without, any, without any compromise. So, so again, you know, how we communicate with them, it's, it's the comfort of what you know, but made in a way that, you know, as I describe it, it's healthy for people, humane for sea life, sustainable for the planet. You know, so it really does offer, you know, just a, a you know, order of magnitude of different benefits. We've actually demonstrated that, and even with food service operators, the benefits even go beyond. So 100% yield, uh, you know, so it's accessible year round. You know, and it's consistent every time, you know, in a, in a world of variability, which exists in seafood. So as I design, you know, the company and the products we're working on, it was very thoughtful about how we can create the greatest amount of benefits because it is something unique to consumers. They're not very familiar with it, but I think the way that the industry has been describing this, it's like manufacturing uh, seafood, as weird as it sounds, but in a microbrewery. So it's made in stainless steel vessels, uh, very similar to what you might find in, in the brewing sector, which now has uh, glass walls, so you could actually dine next to your beer being made. So there may be a day where you might have not, you know, beer or wine, you know, in those large vessels, but seafood. Um, so, you know, th you know th this thing will take time, but I think, uh, candidly, the plant-based category kind of opened people's eyes into consuming something different. They haven't always been thrilled with what the results are. But nonetheless, you know, clearly consumers are seeking something more sustainable and we see our product as it's not imitation, it's the real thing. Um, so something that they'll actually be very motivated to based on the benefits I described. Have, have Lou, looking at you specifically here and, and you, know, you know, Frank and Michelle chime in as well. Have, have you looked, you know, at less traditional sources for inspiration when it comes to innovation? Um, you know, that, that you might not ordinarily think of when it comes to something that could, could actually have a role in some of the products that you all are developing? Um, yeah, uh, the word less traditional. So, I mean, the way like I think- Like 3D about, printing, I think is one, one thing yeah. that, yeah. 
I was going there too. So, so, so yeah, this whole category is really uh, borrowing from all kinds of industry sectors. So, um, so take, take seafood. So, you know, if you think about seafood from a sensory point of view, it could be more of a um, consistent texture or it could be layered. So, you know, what else is layered? Well, packaging is layered. There's, uh, there's laminates and packaging. Chewing gum is layered, you know, pasta, hot dogs, you know, all kinds of products and 3D printing. So there's no shortage of different kind of products that are on the market that use technologies that can be borrowed for this category. So you're absolutely right. So, you know, we've, you know, we're very much, uh, and it's my, it's my background, which is very helpful in open innovation, you know, really saying innovation doesn't happen in house. You know, you got, it's really external, you know, who might have, you know, some innovation in any number of industry sectors that we can leverage for what we're trying to accomplish. And, you know, we, we work very hard to really, you know, we, we're, we even have core values that are all about open innovation and really it's not, you know, the concepts of not invented here is not what this is about. It's really you know, leveraging from, from all the folks out there that have done some wonderful things that we can leverage towards, towards our world. Uh, Frank or Michelle, is there anything that either of you wanted to, to chime in on that? I think from, from our end, obviously, you know, look, we look to culinary, we look to trends in other categories, um, whether it's alcoholic beverage, ice cream, uh, you name it. We, you know, we always look for category, we always look for trends in those categories and how that helps inform our innovation. But even, you know, just in terms of process technology, in terms of packaging technology and how we do that. Um, there's a lot of great research out there. There's a lot of great work going on uh, across a variety of different areas uh, and that we will pull from. Um, I think for us, the, the new unlock is of course uh, AI technology and how we're able to tap into AI and how we're able to help use that to help you know, pull, pull out insights that help inform our, our innovation um, you know our innovation pipeline how that helps inform us so to me that's the that is the big i think unlock for us as a as a corporation michelle was there anything you want to add there yeah i mean for me mostly um this comes from my work with my partners uh the the company that i work with in ecuador that manufactures my chocolate um, or even my my co-packer uh, here in the states that produces my product a lot of uh, the technology innovation, I'm really relying on my partnerships with them because I don't really manage that end of it. Um, but I'm finding, you know, I work with a, a great chocolate company in Ecuador and they are really looking at ways to um, advance how they're doing things that's more cost-effective and allows them to grow their business and I'm happy to, you know, try to be a part of the changes that they're coming up with. Um, but I really take a back seat to what they're doing because that's just not what I can focus on right now. Mm -hmm. um, you, we, we've talked, you know, a lot about all the, the resources that are out there. You know, we, Frank, you touched on AI. Um, you know, there's a lot of data out there as well. Um, is there too much data and information? You know, there's studies, there's social media. Does it become overwhelming? And, and ultimately, how do you navigate that to, to, to hone in on, a, on, you know, what you're going to do when it comes to product development? Michelle, do you want to touch it? Or yeah. Frank, go ahead. <laughs> yes. It's hard. Everybody has an opinion. Um, you know, you just said social media. Again, I go back to... Everybody has an opinion. There's there's like information overload. And um, as I said earlier, sometimes you really have to uh, quiet the noise of the information overload that you're getting. And and I just have to put my head down and, and remember what's my mission of my company, of why I started this, of my goal. And I, I have to really turn some of that off in order to stay focused and, and keep moving forward. It's very easy to fall into those black holes of, you know, information overload. Yeah, and, and I would agree. I think there's a lot of information out there. I mean, this the the amount of data that is just available is is it's overwhelming. But I think ultimately it has to come back to what is your purpose? You know, the purpose within Campbell's, we we connect people through food people love, you know, like that's ultimately what we try and do. Um, 
And, you know, with that in mind, we are always, you know, like you said, you, I don't think there's ever a perfect answer. Um, you know, one of the benefits of working in innovation is that we get to experiment, we get to try things, we get to push the boundaries. Um, you know, and I, and I think that that to me is the ultimate, uh, the ultimate goal. If we're if we're choiceful about the information that we're gonna we're gonna leverage and we're gonna learn from that. Um, you know, having a growth mindset, I think you know everything everything in the end works out. Thank you, Frank. Hey, Chris, um, there is uh, two questions in the chat, or I guess a two-part question that I wanted to throw out to the panelists, if that's okay. Um, so the, the question is, is there a focus on carbon footprint reduction also as part of the innovation going on at any of your organizations in addition to any sustainability um, type of endeavors? Um, that's part one. I guess we can start there. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to jump in for that one. Um, as I started to say earlier, talking about my partners, you know, the, the factory that I work with in Ecuador to manufacture our chocolate chips, our what a big focus that we have with them is on sustainability and um, sustainability and even equality. So uh, working with farms and farmers in Ecuador and Peru um, and, and other regions in the area, we really focus on making sure that as we use product, we help to replace product and that there is um, equality in pay, gender equality in pay, that there is education to uh, accompany the investment. Uh, I don't want to just purchase. I want to make sure that there's an education to help them to renew, restore, and um, minimize the impact of um, what we're doing as, you know, to make chocolate, you need to harvest. And we want to make sure that that we are doing the best we can to minimize our footprint and and replace what we're using. I, I could jump in there. I, I think just to pick up on that too, your consumers just want to connect with your company, your brand. You know, so that's how food has really evolved. You know, where, when people are reading labels, they're trying to they're trying to be part of your company in their own way and 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 feel feel good about their product it needs to taste great but i think that feel good nature is really critical there and that carbon footprint reduction or other kind of societal benefits are all very important i, I know in our world of seafood um, carbon footprint is kind of talking about you know the world of fishing there's at, at least 30 percent bycatch there's a massive environmental footprint then there's a 50 percent yield when it gets to new york city because all the you know, head, tail, bones, and skins go in the garbage, um, you know, from Southeast Asia, for example. So, so and then there's, all, of course, all the labor on, on fishing boats, which we've all heard about, and, and all the gas that goes on those boats and oil on those boats as well. So all that's displaced by a vertically integrated factory. It's a bit like vertical farming that's closer to home, you know, close to population center. So it's a total paradigm shift for carbon footprint when it comes to how, how our world of seafood can be in the future. But in, in one way or the other, I think it's really critical that consumers find those attributes that your company is able to, to manifest, you know, that, that really are making some sort of, a, you know, a, a contribution towards our planet and our future. Yeah, and, and just to follow up on that, I mean, the Campbell's organization, we have um, ESG goals that are, that are in our focus on innovation all the time. Um, you know, things like water usage, things like, you know, our carbon footprint and how we measure that. Those are things that we all take into consideration as uh, we progress forward with our innovation. Like I said, getting to recyclable and compostable packaging. I think we're very proud of the fact that our, our cans, our soup business, you know, those cans are infinitely recyclable. So like we have some, we have some great stuff that, that we can highlight and talk about. Um, you know, and then, you know, ultimately for the future, you know, how do we, you know, you know, how can we minimize, you know, sort of 
multiple steps in transportation. So having mills for flour, you know, connected to our plants. How can we how can we just find ways to get more efficient in in what we do and and minimize our carbon footprint? All those things are are critical to the Campbell's organization. Great. Thank you. Um, so we are nearing the top of the hour here. Uh, so I'm going to just wrap us up a, a bit. Uh, I just want to say a, a big thank you to Michelle, Frank, and Lou for, um, you know, taking some time out of your day to talk to us about your organizations and what you're doing. A lot of really great stuff here. I don't think um, anyone on the, on the call here um, could have learned more in an hour. <laughs> Uh, so thank you for that. Um, thank you, Chris, for moderating a really great discussion and, and keeping everyone chatting, although I think they, uh, they did a pretty good job on that themselves. So I really appreciate everyone's time. Uh, I also want to thank all the attendees for joining us, and um, we hope you found it very interesting and valuable, and we hope to see you in person at our May 11th event coming up in New Jersey. And um, thanks again. Enjoy the rest of your day.